Joe Hurley's just logged on to not to Facebook. I wear two sets of glasses. One is the well, first part is trifocal, but this is this pair of glasses here just for close range, like looking at a computer. When I have my trifocals on, I go I go this way. How how far are you trying to see? <clears throat> Okay, folks, the word of God is alive and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and the spirit and the joints and the marrow and is a critic of the thoughts and intents of the heart. All scripture is God-breathed and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be mature, thirty forties unto all good works. Study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And we're going to take just a moment of time to prepare ourselves for the study of God, God's word, through Operation Recovery, which is actually 1 John 1 9, and also Operation Cry. Sir Daryl talked about that last night. It was included in part of his message. So with your heads bowed and eyes closed, you make your own way with the Lord through the confession of your own personal sins. I will close out our prayer time and pick up our study right where we left off last Sunday morning. <clears throat> Father, once again, we come to you for an understanding of your word. The pastor teacher teaches the Holy Spirit is the one who makes clear the teaching of the Word of God. Father, for the spiritual gifts that you provide, I, I couldn't be any more pleased or happy with the gift of pastor-teacher. Every believer in Christ will find happiness, joy, just pleased with the spiritual gift that they have as they have the opportunity to exercise that spiritual gift. So tonight as we continue studying the Word of God, I, I can't I can't say it any more any more clear than this. The study tonight is a continuation of what Paul was teaching the Colossians in the very first chapter of that epistle. But there couldn't be any, any more clarity than what Paul is telling us that is going to make it very clear as to what the Christian way of life is. And again, we've said that it doesn't end with salvation. But when it, be, when it becomes clear or begins to become clear as to what the Christian way of life really is, many just shrink. Unbelievable impossible and they're talking about the execution of your plan for their lives what a tragedy well father those who are logged on with me tonight understand what the christian way of life is and we're going to dig into this thing tonight just a brief review and then continue on to find out what the christian way of life is really all about and i pray this in christ's name and for his sake amen well, let me just uh, indicate Colossians 1.10 is where we're going after we finish this um, polytuma metaphor. That uh, won't take very long, I don't believe, and then we'll get into Colossians 1.10. Mark your calendar for March 10th, 2024, American Pie Pizza, Bible Class Fellowship Luncheon. All right, let's get back to our uh, to our notes now. And we're going to start with the idea of the polytuma metaphor. We said that that word polytuma actually is a word that means civilization. Uh, uh, no, not civilization. It's 
It's where we have our citizenship. It's where we have our citizenship and that's in heaven. So let's look at the idea that during the time of the writing of Paul, when he's writing to uh, our group of people in Colossia, we actually took a look at Ephesians 1.18 as if we were dealing with the idea of inheritance. And we discovered at the moment of your salvation, the Holy Spirit takes you out of Adam and places you in Christ. And as a result of being placed in Christ, we actually have what we call positional truth. As a result of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, where he takes you out of Adam and places you in Christ, there, there is a the concept of positional truth that immediately occurs in your life, but without doctrine, you don't know that. And it's called retroactive positional truth and current positional truth. Retroactive positional truth identifies you with the death, the burial, and the, uh, and the resurrection of Christ. Then the ascension and session at the right hand of God the Father is our current positional truth. So we have this idea of positional truth, but at the same time, we realize that back in eternity past, God knew through his omniscience who would believe in Jesus Christ during the age of grace. And for those believers, God the Father provided an inheritance. So we inherit something, but we've discovered that unless you love Jesus Christ to the point where you are actually doing the 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 truths of God's word relative to the Christian and to the Christian way of life, that unless you are obedient to those guidelines, the distribution of your inheritance will not take place at the Bema Seat of Christ. In other words, you suffer that loss. Well, since Paul is talking to us about this idea of inheritance, let's go back and look at Ephesians chapter 1, verses uh, 8, uh, verse 18 through 20. And then we'll continue on from there. This is review, 18, 19, and 20. And here's what Paul said to the Ephesians. He said, I pray. Paul's interceding on behalf of the Ephesians. He said, I pray that the eyes of your heart. I've given a lot of thought to this idea of the eyes of your heart. Well, first of all, we have to know that the heart's not in your chest. The heart's in the right lobe of the mentality. And this is where, now remember, right lobe of the mentality. You got a left lobe over here, which is where you receive the word. But it's transferred, transferred over into the right lobe when you believe it. So the right lobe of the mentality has a a section of the right lobe that's called a frame of reference. And that frame of reference has three things in it. Vocabulary. And without vocabulary, it is impossible for you or me or anyone else to think. So what we're looking for is Bible vocabulary, words in the Bible that are used in relationship to the totality of the Christian way of life, God's plan, purpose, and will for your life. So we have vocabulary storage area in the right lobe. You also have category a ca category of doctrine. It's a categorical storage area where through your vocabulary, you begin to develop, develop doctrines from the word of God so in the right lobe of the mentality, you have this frame of reference that has the section for vocabulary, the section for categor categorical doctrine, and also your conscience, which is based on what you accept as being true. But what you want is doctrine stored in your conscience. You want the truth stored there because it is your conscience that will bother you when you do something wrong, when you sin, your conscience will bother you based upon the fact that the truth is you have the truth. And in your conscience, there may be falsities. You've bought something that's the lie. It's not true. 
And when you violate that, it will your conscience will also bother you. But what we're looking for is a conscience based on truth. So over here in the right lobe mental mentality, you have these three areas inside. It's like the frame reference is a sphere, a circle. And inside that frame of reference is the vocabulary storage, categorical storage, and your conscience. Based, hopefully, based on truth. Now, when you begin your Christian way of life, you don't have much doctrine, if any at all, in the right lobe of your mentality. So here's this story, Jerry, over there, your frame of reference, looking to build vocabulary, biblical vocabulary into your right lobe. It's looking to, it's looking to build doctrinal categories so that you'll have a greater perception of what the Christian way of life is all about. And then you have this conscience based on truth. And what Paul is saying here, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened and if the eyes of your heart are not enlightened, that means you don't have much vocabulary. You don't have many categories of doctrine stored there. You have a conscience that's based on false information. So Paul's saying, I want the eyes of your heart to be enlightened. And I would suggest then that the eyes of your heart needing to be enlightened indicates that it's not enlightened yet. And Paul is praying or interceding for these Ephesians that the eyes of their heart and the eyes of their heart is a combination of your vocabulary section, your categorical storage, and your conscience, all desiring to be filled with doctrinal information. So I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened. Paul's saying, I want you to get more vocabulary. I want you to build I want you to build more doctrines, categories of doctrine. And I want your your conscience to be based on the truth. So he said, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened. In other words, get more in there. And then he tells us why he wants our right lobe, this frame of reference up here, why he wants the eyes of our heart to be enlightened. He said, so that here, here it is. Listen to this now. There, Paul's going to give us some things here as to why he wants the eyes of our heart to be enlightened. He said, so that you will know what is the hope of his calling. God the Father has elected us. God the Father has called us into the Christian way of life. Calling, election. God the Father in eternity past saw that you would believe in Jesus Christ. That's his omniscience. He saw that you would believe in Jesus Christ. So he designed this inheritance for you. So what the, the one of the things that, that we're going to inherit is eternal life in heaven. It's, um, it's amazing how many people, and even those who believe that they're Christians, have little or no assurance of their salvation not certain whether or not they're going to go to heaven or not when they die. Well, what is it? They may, made me think that they're, uh, they, they received a false doctrine. Uh, they're not living the way that they think that Christian ought to, to live in order to, um, to finalize the notion that they're going to, to going, going to go to heaven. And so Paul says, look, I want you to make sure that the eyes of your heart are enlightened so that you will know of the assurance of your calling. And the assurance of your calling is to know for certain what your eternal future happens to be. So he says, I want you to be knowledge about that, knowledgeable about that. I don't want you to be wishy-washy, going through life, wondering what in the world, am I going to go to heaven when I die or am I not? So he wants us to have the assurance of our calling. He wants us to know about phase three of our Christian way of life, and for us to be certain about that. So he said, I want you to know what is the hope of your calling. Then he says, this is a second thing. What is the hope of your calling, and what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance? And so this, this idea of uh, the riches of the glory, we said that's glorious wealth. 
So what happens is there is a wealth of God's riches out there in the future waiting for us. If you're saved, you're going to heaven. That's part of your inheritance. But what happens after you, you get into phase three? Are we going to receive our inheritance? Or is it going to be withheld? And it has everything to do with whether or not you're going to be obedient in phase two of your Christian way of life. And obviously, the more, the more spiritual growth you have, leading to spiritual maturity, you have the greatest opportunity to have a wealth of doctrine in your soul, have enough information to be able to handle every circumstance of life, no matter how good, how bad it happens to be. God has made every provision for us. So he wants us to have the assurance of what's going to be out there in phase three, and for us to know the boundless great boundless there are no boundaries the boundless greatness of his power see that's the third thing what is the hope of his calling what is the glorious wealth of his inheritance and what is the boundless greatness of his power toward us who believe now how can we have what, what can we know about this power that he's talking about here. The power to know the boundless greatness of his power. How great is omnipotence? How much greater could omnipotence be? But what he wants us to know is something about this, this boundless greatness of his power toward us who believe, that is those who have believed in Jesus Christ, then he said, these, what is these? These are the hope of his, uh, the hope of his calling, the riches of his inheritance and the brown and the, uh, the boundless greatness of his, his power. He said, these then, these three things are in accordance with the working of his might. Now watch this, this boundless power that he has. We need to realize that when Jesus got on that cross he died spiritually then he died physically then he was buried and there he is in the grave his spirit's gone to be with the father his soul went into paradise and his body's laying there in the grave now what is it going to take to give this dead body life what, what what's it going to take this is what Paul's talking about here. These are in accordance with the working of his might. This is God the Father's power. And then he just, he tells us something about how we get a good idea of what that power is. And it's the very power which he brought about in Christ. We're turning our focus back on Christ now, realizing that he died, he's buried. He's laying there in the grave. And the omnipotent power of God raised him out of that grave. His spirit came back. His soul came up. They met with his body. And here he is now in a resurrected body. How did God do that? He did this with his omnipotent power. And it's the same omnipotent power that God is talking about here when he talks about, and what is the boundless greatness of his power toward us who believe? God's provided an inheritance in eternity past. He's given us information that will help us to under know and to know and understand what is the assurance of his calling for phase three. And what is the boundless grace, uh, greatness of his power, that's his omnipotent power, and if we want to know something about what that omnipotent power is, we have to look at a dead Jesus Christ. The, the, the physical body is dead. And how God the Father is going to bring, with his omnipotent power, bring all this back in the life of Christ to raise him from the dead, let him ascend up into heaven and be seated at the right hand, at his own right hand, as a sign of the power 
that's given to Jesus Christ. And then he goes on to say in verse 20, he says, which he, God the Father, this power, which he brought about in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand at, in heavenly places. Now that's verse 18, 19, and 20. Now we pick up with verse 21, brand new tonight. We, we, need to, we need to go back now to verse 20. He's talking about his omnipotent power. In verse 19, and he goes on into verse 20 and talks about this omnipotent power that he had to raise Jesus Christ from the dead. And when we're talking then in verse 21 about this power, look what it says. He's raised Jesus up. He is Jesus is now sitting at the right hand of God the Father. And he's not just sitting there saying, whoo, boy, that, I'm sure glad all that's over. I'm going to sit here and I'm going to rest. Well, what God the Father is telling us here then is that when he was seated at the right hand of God the Father, remember, we are in a spiritual battle called the angelic conflict. So why should we, why should we, or why should Christ be um, concerned about anything other than the fact that, oh my, my death, my burial, my resurrection are all over. I finished with all that torture, all that pain that I under that I underwent, paying for the sins of the world, paying for the sins of Jim Bertel, paying for the sins of somebody else, actually paid for the sins of the entire world. But when Jesus was seated at the right hand of God the Father, there is meaning there. Because we're talking about living moment by moment, hour after hour, day after day, week, month, year, decade, in a spiritual battle called the angelic conflict. And I certainly wouldn't like to have a leader who is powerless. And we have a good example of that. I won't go too far with this. But we have a classic example of a top leader that has no power. I hope you understand. But when Jesus was seated at the right hand of God the Father, it was a position of authority. Is it authority with no power? Is it authority with no hope? Is the word authority, is that just empty words? A title? No, when Jesus was seated at the right hand of God the Father, we need to understand about his position in relationship to the spiritual battle called the angelic conflict. So God the Father seated Jesus at the right hand of God, at his own right hand, and Paul tells us here in verse 21, he says, far above all rule and authority and power, far above all rule, far above all authority, far above all power, far above all dominion. Now, what we're looking at is Jesus Christ here. He did more than just save us. He is in a position of authority in this, in this spiritual battle called the angelic conflict, and I would not want him to be my authority, hit my leader, my commanding officer, if he didn't have some kind of authority. We saw just this past week in the Super Bowl, a particular player, it's, I don't, I'm not, not a, this is not meant to be negative. I just want to show you something. One of the Super Bowl players on the team that won the Super Bowl actually bumped his coach, got in his face and railed at him. Can you imagine you doing that to Jesus Christ? Can you imagine us taking a look at God the Father, bumping him because we don't like what he's doing, railing against him because he's allowed us to be in some kind of a circumstance? No. Jesus Christ is sitting at the right hand of God the Father, and this is what it says. He said he is, the, his authority, his power, his who he is, is far above all rule, far above all, all authority, Fall above, far above all power, fall far above all dominion, 
and far above any every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. Wait a minute. What does all this mean? When Paul writes and says, the authority of Jesus, the power that he has because he's seated at the right hand of God the Father. For above all, by means of Christ's ascension, he was in the grave. He was resurrected. And he was when he was resurrected, he didn't spend the rest of his life down here on planet Earth. God the Father raised him up to heaven and seated him at his own right hand. And it says, by means of his, his ascension into heaven, God the Father then elevated the rank of Christ above every order of authority, whether that authority is angelic or human. While millions of things are falling apart down here on planet Earth, we have a Savior that's seated at the right hand of God the Father. And when, when any human authority begins to manifest itself, when some form of angelic authority begins to manifest itself, and it looks like as a result of this authority that's gone haywire, gone against God, it might appear as though whoo, somebody's found a way to control God to have rule over God, to rule over Jesus Christ. What we need to do is come back and read this passage and realize that when God the Father, with his omnipotent power, raised Jesus from the dead, allowed him to walk on planet Earth for 40, year, for 40 days, and then brought him up to heaven, as he ascended up into heaven and was seated at the right hand of God the Father, we need to know that whatever power is out here, whether it's human power, your boss, your superintendent, the policeman on the street, the Supreme Court, the President of the United States, or anything else. There is no power greater than Christ's power. No authority greater than him. So his authority is authority that is above any human or angelic authority in the angelic conflict. So if you understand there is an angelic conflict, if you do understand and see the, the manifestation of the angelic conflict at this point in time, just how bad can it get? Can it get any worse? Oh, yes, it can. Well, I guess Jesus must have died and gone away. He must have lost his power. He must have taken a vacation. No, he didn't do any of that. His power, his authority, his rule is far above all human and angelic authority. Now look here. Got a couple bullet points here. We're talking about the Christian way of life. The scope of Christ's victory on the cross was universal. Now what does that mean? That when Christ was on the cross... He paid for the sins of the world. Just how effective was that work of Christ dying physically on, dying spiritually, and then dying physically on the cross, being placed in the grave? Is he ever going to come out of there? Oh my, he's gone. We'll never see him again. No, you see, the scope of Christ's victory on the cross, whatever victory he won, whatever the battle was, he won it while he was on the cross, and his victory was universal. In other words, his victory was victory over everything. There's nothing that he didn't overcome by his work on the cross. The scope of Christ's victory on the cross, in other words, what he did on the cross, that victory was universal, indicating that no matter which way you look, up, down, left, right, however... And whatever was involved in the up, down, left, and right, Jesus is superior to all of that. He is our Savior. He has, he's, his victory is not only universal, but it was universal even over cosmic powers. 
What do you mean? He was victorious over cosmic powers. The cosmic powers are Satan's strategies. So when you begin to, to look at this doctrine of the cosmic system, it's the world system that is being ruled by Satan with all of his strategies to distract us, to get us away from the word of God, to get, it, get us away from the purpose, the will of God for our life, so that we would be defeated and really be worthless to God in the angelic conflict. So the scope of Christ's victory on the is that victory, it's universal victory. There's nothing over which he doesn't have. Then what Satan's going to use to try to distract you and me. You see, Christ's rank was not only above, but notice what it says, far above the authority, the power, the rank of Jesus. Hmm. I'm thinking of the military background. You've got these four-star this, five-star that, something like that. There is a, there is a power in the military over which there is no, no other height. This is where Jesus is. The rank that, that God the Father gave him when he set him down at the right hand of, of, of himself, that is the Father, Christ's rank was not only above, but it was far above any power, any power, or any authority. Now, notice what Paul says here again. He says, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion. Now, let's see. Let's look at the number, number of words there. Far above all rule, one. Far above all authority, two. Far above all power, three. Far above all dominion. And that word dominion there simply means supremacy. So the, the, the authority and the power that Jesus has given to him by his father, his authority is greater than any rulership any authority, any human or angelic power, any human or angelic supremacy. So what we see here then in this verse, what's he telling us? He's talking to us about the, the Christian way of life as it relates to the spiritual battle called the angelic conflict. So here's what he says. The words rule, authority, power, and dominion or supremacy in that phrase, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, those four words in that phrase refer to various categories of angels. Rule, far above all rule. Those four words are dealing with angels, types of angels, categories of angels. So when he says rule and authority and power and dominion, those four words in that phrase, relate to various categories of angels. I'm going to give you three. And when I, when I, uh, when I was putting this together, every time, every time we go through a, a verse or a passage of Scripture, it seems as though that as you're digging down deeper into spiritual Murfreesboro, to get beyond babyhood, to get beyond spiritual adolescence, Seeking and searching out maturity. It seems as though that when you're digging all this out, you run into something that's brand new, something that's not clear, and it needs to be clarified. So here we are, we're talking about the authority of Jesus being greater than any human or angelic power. And when you start to talk about the power, of angels or the rank of angels, what we do is we see when we're studying the word of God that there are in fact categories of angels. 
For example, seraphim angels. There are cherubim angels. There are parsevant angels. And say, wait a minute. Uh, what, what are we talking about? We're talking about ranks of angels. Angels have ranks. Some angels have greater power, greater authority than others. So when we're looking about this idea that the authority of Jesus is greater than the authority of any human being or any angel, if we don't have an idea that angels have rank as a part of their who they are in the angelic conflict, and we know that when we read about Satan and the fallen angels, there's rank among them. Satan has an organized force that attends his plan. So what we're looking here, when we're talking about um, angels with power, angels with authority, we're going to talk about the seraphim angels. We're going to talk about the cherubim angels. We're going to talk about the Percival angels. And so when you hear all that, you say, oh, my goodness, wonder how many don't understand those three types of angels. Well, what that means is somewhere along the line in the future, we're going to have to come back here and understand who these angels are. Because Jesus has authority greater than any human or any angel. You see, Paul used terms of power. Terms of power. Why? Because, the, because of the exalted nature of angels. Wait a minute, what are you talking about? Exalted um, nature of angels. Well, this is why I indicated, and have indicated in the past, Sir Daryl has done the same thing. There are other pastors that understand this and are, are very clear about this. But when you're talking about the power of angels, remember when God created Adam as a human being, he created Adam lower than the angels. And what are we talking about? We're talking about the exalted nature of who these and what these angels are. So God creates mankind. He creates a man. He creates what eventually comes to be not created at all. He created one man, built one woman from that man, and then through sexual relationship we have the human being a human race being born physically and because adam sinned the human race had, every every person in the human race has an old sin nature in every cell of their body a fallen nature but what we see here then is when we see this fallen nature why why did god create man lower than the angel why is it uh, uh why is that he did that and if he's creating man lower than the angel, that mean, that must mean there's something that is exalted about that angel. Something a little more about that angel that mankind doesn't have. So Paul uses the power, uses the terms of power, rule, authority, power, and dominion. He uses those words because they, they are related to the exalted nature of of angels. God the Father placed all forms of authority, whether angelic angels, uh, elect angels. God the Father placed all forms of authority, whether elect angels or fallen angels, under the dominion of the Lord Jesus Christ. So we've got these angels out here. We have elect angels. Those are the angels that didn't fall. We've got one-third of the angelic creation that fell and fall, fallen after Satan. And with this exalted nature of these angels, there has to be someone more powerful than them, with more authority than them. So God the Father placed all forms of authority whether it was elect angels or fallen angels, demonic angels, that is, under the dominion of Jesus Christ. Notice what it says as it goes on. 
in verse 21, it says, far above, he's talking about Christ now, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and every name that is named. You see, in that phrase, uh, and every name that is named, what has happened here is that Paul has, first of all, taken a look at this exalted group of people called angels with all of their authority, uh, all of their authority, all of their power, based on looking at this person over here that's called a human being. And we see here, Paul says, and above every name that is named. So in this phrase, what Paul is doing is showing the universality of, rule, of the rule of Christ over any cosmic force anywhere. So when you look around at whatever you see, whoever you see, what's going on over there, we need to understand that Jesus Christ has more authority, more power than any human being, any, any angel, or any other form of creature. And Paul is telling us about this person of Jesus Christ, and remembering again that all of this is related to the spiritual battle called the angelic conflict. So when Paul says, and every name that is named, because the above list of four types of authority, we've seen just now, we've seen four different types of authority. Rule, authority, power, and dominion. And because that list, when it's talking about angels with this rule, with this authority, with this power, with this dominion, Paul said, wait a minute, just a second. We're talking about angels over here, but we want you to understand that this authority that belongs to Jesus Christ is above anything else that you can even think about. And that's why he says, not only the rule and authority and power of angels, he says, and every name that is named, Jim Bertel, who, and then, and then, who are you going to name? And he's wanting us to know for sure, because the above list of four types of authority, rule, authority, power, and dominion, is not exhaustive. When Paul spoke those words, he said, wait a minute, he said, I have to let you know that when I'm talking about this angelic authority out there, that doesn't exhaust the possibility of authority out there. So he says, Jesus has authority above every name that is named. Paul made this comprehensive statement that includes any authority that could possibly exist. Jesus is number one, related to the angelic conflict now. Then Paul goes on and continues this idea that this list is not exhaustive. He said, in every name that is named, so we're going to take a look at all the human race. Let's talk about David. Let's talk about Jeremiah. Let's talk about Ezekiel. Let's talk about Daniel. Let's talk about, and you just name them. Then you say, wait a minute. Let's get up into the New Testament. Let's talk about Peter. Let's talk about Paul. Let's talk about who you want to talk about. He said that Jesus, the authority of Jesus is above all angels, every human being, and any name that can be named. Not only, he says, not only in this age, Paul's talking about the age of grace. So get out of the Old Testament, get out of the Gospels. Get up to Acts chapter 9, and let's, be, let's talk about the... the um, uh, let's talk about the power of people in the age of grace. Those people that are noted historically with all their ideas, with all their whoever they are, whatever they are. Paul said, hold on just a second. It's not just angels. He said, you name a name. Who do you think it is? Ronald Reagan? Hitler? Mussolini? Who are we talking about? 
He said, you name any name you want to in the age of grace. And he says, Jesus has more authority and more power than they do. He said, okay, well, uh, let, let, that's fine. That's fine, Paul. But wait a minute. There are other ages. There's another age coming up after in the future. He said, okay, let me throw that one in too. He said, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. He's talking about the millennium. So Jesus will rule in the millennium and he will rule forever. So nothing will eclipse. Nothing will ever be higher. Nothing will ever be greater than the authority and the power of Jesus Christ, even in the millennial kingdom and in eternity future. So what do we get out of this verse? We learn about the power and the authority of the one who's leading us in this angelic conflict. Now moving to verse 22. So we've just seen about all this power that Jesus has. And we got two people in view here. Two major people. God the Father, who's the, the final authority. He's the one that's had this, created this plan that's going on right now. And again, when you see all the, all the mess that's going on around the world right now, it's interesting. I, I, I find it interesting that when you read the news and there is a major, there is a major figure on a conservative news program that he's frequently called upon to talk about what's going on. Now he's, a, he, he's not a pastor now, but he used to be a pastor. He wasn't a pastor. He still probably he still has the gift of pastor teacher. He's just not functioning as a pastor. And when he comes on to talk, and they want to know what his opinion is of what's going on, he'll make a statement that's something similar to this. I'm so worried about what's going on. I worry about this. I worry about that. I'm greatly concerned about this, greatly concerned. I'm saying, wait a minute, just a second, just a second. That's not the way a Christian should be talking. A Christian pastor should not be talking about falling apart, worried about anything in life. We have an authority that's, that's our guide, authority over everything that there is. So in verse 22, he says, and he, that's God the Father, put all things in subject, uh, subjection under his feet and made him head over all things to the church. Wait a minute. What does that mean? Well, let's talk about this for just a second. When it starts out, the first two words are, and he. He is God the Father. He's the author of the plan. He's the one who chose his son to become a human being. And in a certain period of time, be born physically of a virgin. And many years later to die for the sins of you, me, and every other human being. So when he would, when he, when Jesus ascended into heaven, seated at the right hand of, of God the Father, God the Father put all things in subjection, all things, everything. Well, what about this? That's covered by all things. Well, what about this over here? It's covered by all things. Well, maybe he missed this over here. It's covered by all things. And God the Father has put all things in subjection under his feet, Christ's feet. Well, what does that mean? We'll take a look at that here in just a second. So God the Father put all things, everything, there's nothing, there's not under God, uh, Christ's hand, his life, 
his mind, his thinking, his power. All things have been put in subjection under Christ's feet. And God the Father made Christ, listen to this, God the Father made Christ head as top dog. That's the most important person. God the Father made Jesus Christ head over all things to the church. Well, what is that? When it says put all things in subjection under Christ's feet, this is an indication of victory over your enemies. Nothing has the power or the likeness of Jesus Christ. And God the Father put all things, everything, under Christ's authority and made him, Christ, head over all things to the church. The word church there means the body of Christ. Christ is the authority over the body of Christ. If you are a believer in Christ, you are a Christian, you're part of the body of Christ, and I don't care how smart you think you are, how wonderful you think you are, how much power you think you have, you're under God's authority. You're under Christ's authority. God the Father assigned the, the body of Christ to be under the authority of Jesus Christ. Now, I made an indicate made a, made a comment in the last couple of sessions that when we when we discovered through the word of God that God the Father decreed an eternity pass an inheritance to you. Whew, my goodness. All that he all that he designed for us. He said, here it is. And then we learn that unless we are obedient to God the Father's plan, that inheritance goes out the window. That if we're not carrying out the will of God in our lives. I alluded to this the other day. I think Sir Darrell alluded to it also. It's that passage in 1 Corinthians 3, 11 through 15. Gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, and stubble. That's part of your inheritance, the gold, silver, and precious stones. But if you're living a false Christian life, you'll be saved for an eternity. You can't lose it. But you will suffer loss of the bemacy because you failed to live the Christian way of life. So God the Father put all things in subjection under Christ's feet and made Christ head over all things to the body of Christ. Now let's take a look at that phrase, head over all things to the body of Christ. At the will of God the Father, God the Father, at the will of God the Father, it is God the Father's will that Jesus rule over everything. You see, both the Father and the Son reign together over all created things. As angels, human beings, all created things, the Father and the Son have rulership over everything. This includes rule over the body of Christ. Now listen, this includes rule over the body of Christ, which is referred to as the Bride of Christ. The body of Christ is the bride of Christ. Jesus Christ is the is the is the husband. We are the bride. Paul talks about the church being the bride of Christ, and he's going to talk about that and expand that in chapter five. Now watch this. Paul will develop that idea of the bride of Christ in chapter five. But Paul, in other verses, called the body of Christ, that's what we call the church. Paul, in other verses, calls the body, the body of Christ the church of the living God. He also calls it the pillar and support of truth. The pillar and support 
of truth. He does that, the church of the living God and the pillar of support of, the, of truth. He does that in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15. You see, the body of, the body of Christ belongs to Jesus. We belong to Jesus. We are the body of Christ. If you're a believer in Jesus, you're a part of that body, and we belong to Jesus. The body of Christ serves as the foundation. Listen, the body of Christ, let's just picture a sphere out here, and every regenerate person, saved person, believer in Jesus Christ, believe in his death and the burial and, and his resurrection. We are inside that circle that's called the body of Christ. Now, when we're talking about Christianity, I, uh, we, need, we need to realize that Christianity is not a religion. It's a spiritual way of life designed to carry out the angelic conflict in the age of grace. So the body of Christ serves as the foundation of God's truth to the world in the age of grace. Stop here. We've got this entire world out here. The world's gone berserk. People now, more often than any time in my life, are talking about the return of Jesus in the air. Talking about the rapture of the church. Will it be today? Will it be tomorrow? We don't know, but oh my, when you look around and see how things are going out here, it looks to me like it might be very, very soon. Well, what we need to understand is this. Until that moment comes, as long as you have breath left, as long as I have breath left, hold it now, doesn't make any difference who you are, what you are, your ethnicity, your race, the amount of money you have or don't have. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, we are Christians. And what we need to realize is the body of Christ, that's you and me. We serve as the foundation of God's truth to the world. We have the truth. The world doesn't have it. And we are the foundation of that truth, and God wants us to present that truth to the world. We have a spiritual, uh, a nature. We are, we are royal. We're, listen, we're we're royalty. You are a royal priest, which which enables you then to represent yourself before God. You don't have to go to God through me or anybody else. You take your life, and you present it to God yourself. But not only do we have a royal priesthood, listen to me, please, you have a royal ambassadorship. And as a part of the body of Christ, being the serving as the foundation of God's truth to the world that's going crazy, that's going to hell, and eventually to the lake of fire, if they're not believers. God is relying upon you and me, us, we, believers, as the foundation of truth. So the question is, if people out here in the world are lost, if Christians are in reversionism, if Christians are carnal, if Christians are ignorant, where are they going to get the truth? But it'll come from the it'll come from the word of God for sure. But you know what? You, I, me, we, as believers, are the foundation of God's truth to the world. And we can present that truth both coming out of our mouth and or equally as important, and sometimes even I would say in certain circumstances, more important. And that is your life, your life before the world. Many Christians believe that they can grow spiritually apart from the body of Christ. 
this and that. Jesus Christ is the head of over all, over all things to the church, the body of Christ. And what I'm indicating to you, and I've seen this in action, many Christians believe they can grow spiritually apart from the body of Christ. That's not you. That's not you on Zoom. That's not you wonderful people out here on, on Facebook. But what we're doing is we're looking around the world and seeing the number of believers who don't have a clue about what life is about, don't have, don't have a clue about the angelic conflict. And I had someone recently say to me, it wouldn't be an uncommon thing to find that many Christians don't know about the angelic conflict. Oh, they may have heard of angels. But they've never heard about a battle between God and Satan, never heard about a battle between Satan and believers. So the idea here that many Christians believe that they can grow spiritually apart from the body of Christ, this would be someone who is just about as arrogant as they can be. For whatever way or whatever way or whatever reason, they actually believe that Jesus was the son of God. They believed that he died on the cross, was buried and resurrected three days later. But in terms of what the Christian way of life is all about, the will of God, the purpose of God for your life and mine, the pastors have failed. They have failed. That is these people who have gone away from, from the word of God and away from the body of Christ, believing that somehow or another they can grow spiritually apart from the body of Christ. That doesn't mean you have to be a member of the church. The church doesn't need membership. The church, the body of Christ, needs the word of God. We need pastors who teach the word of God. You cannot grow spiritually apart from the body of Christ. That means you're saved but you're not, you're not functioning in, in the circles that God would have us to, to live in fellowship, in unity. So many Christians believe they can grow spiritually apart from the body of Christ. And the, in, the, the, the idea here is interaction. And what we need to realize is this, interaction with the body of Christ the body of Christ is the human living group of fellow believers. And what we're indicating here is that that interaction with the body of Christ. And this is why when we when every every month when we do the Bible class fellowship luncheon. It is it is a magnificent thing. It's a wonderful thing. To meet with a group of people face to face like we did in church when we went to church and claimed the fellowship there, we need interaction. Yes, we do. But sometimes that interaction won't be face-to-face. -face. But Sir Darrell has mentioned, I think every time he opens, opens the program, opens his class, he talks about the, the modern day in which we live, where we're able to reach out we can reach out and see people three, four thousand miles away. From here to the Philippines, we're probably looking at three thousand miles. Uh, I, I don't, I'm not sure that that's not right. Whatever, whatever the amount of miles it is from here to the Philippines, from here to Russia, from here to China, from here to Japan. No matter what that is, we can have interaction. I could ask all of you if you have a if you have a camera. I could ask you to open your camera right now. We could see each other. It would not be face to face, but I'd be looking at your face. I'd see your wonderful face. I'd see that smile on your face. I would see the joy in your life. I'd see the happiness that is there. Ten thousand miles away. 
we're able to talk with each other. I can't reach out and touch you, but I can see you. I can, I can, I can hear you. I can feel who you are by your lifestyle. My oh my. The, the body of Christ needs interaction. It's essential to a believer's spiritual growth. And that's why we meet here. I thank God for the internet. I thank God for computers. The third computer I bought was one that you could carry around. It weighed 85 pounds. I paid $10,000 for my first computer. I, had a, I actually had a, um, a printer that I didn't have to buy that would have cost me another $3,000. This is back in the 1980s. My wife came home and said, you need a, and Janet said, you need a computer. Well, I went out and bought one. At that time, $10,000. The second one that I bought was, was $8,000. And there was a period of time when I had purchased for myself and for other people, this is not an exaggeration, about 50, about 50 computers. I was involved in the purchase of 50 computers for people. And it was that 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 it was at that time made possible because Texas at that point in time did not have any in have any taxes. And we were buying computers from an organization in Texas. But wait a minute, that's not what we're supposed to do. I'm being told by pastor after pastor after pastor, by a believer after believer after believer, by deacon after deacon after deacon. No, you need to, we need to get together face to face. And you get together face to face and get some little ditty of a sermon that means nothing to us. Nothing. But through the internet, we can learn doctrine from the other side of the world, down the street. You're ill, you can't get out of a house. And I've indicated this in, in, in the past on probably more than one occasion. So that when I went to the internet, and it was so, so horrible, disastrous, it was evil to go to the internet. Net. Why? Forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. But that meant get together in a building somewhere. What we learned was when COVID struck, all that arrogance, that thought about the internet, all that changed in a heartbeat. But the truth of the matter is we can't learn the word of God. We can't grow spiritually apart from the body of Christ. Interaction is needed. You see, it is the family of believers working together who serve in this world as the bride of Christ. It's the family of believers working together who serve in this world as the bride of Christ. You see, the body of Christ working together requires cooperation and unity. We can't work together if we're not cooperative. There has to be unity in the body of Christ. And I, I, I was, the thought came across my mind again. When you see, you see this idea of cooperation and unity, unity within the body of Christ. And what did what is Daryl what is Daryl taught about this? Daryl, if I'm wrong about this, you can correct me. But I think you've made made the comment that there are like thirty three thousand different kinds and sorts of Christians. Correct. Okay, pal, thank you. 33,000. Where is the unity? You can't be a Baptist and a Methodist and a Catholic. A Church of Christ. A Pentecostal. You can't be that. A Lutheran, Episcopalian, Presbyterian. 
You can't be that and have unity. It's impossible. So there must be something wrong out here. Something wrong. And I think without a shadow of a doubt, what we're doing here is something that people need to come to us, not, not the Bible, not the Christian way of life church. They need to come to us and, and see the format, see the way that we're carrying out our Christian life. As people assemble together to hear the word of God from a right pastor teacher, it doesn't have to be me. But there can be no unity if we have different doctrine, different purposes. No, it can't be. So those who seek spirit, those who seek to sp uh, to grow spiritually apart from the body of Christ, what do they do? If people are trying to, to grow spiritually apart from the body of Christ, they're going to miss out on an important aspect of Christianity. And the Christian way of life, and that's called cooperation and unity. Being part of the body of Christ is part of God the Father's design and is foundational, foundational to spiritual maturity. Ephesians 1.23, and we've got about between four and five minutes. We'll start this verse. In verse 23, he says, which is the body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. What are we talking about here? Which is his body, which is a pronoun, and it refers to the noun church or body of Christ. So which body of Christ is his body? Who is his? His body, the body of Christ, is Jesus's body, not a physical body. But the, the, the body of Christ, really what that's saying is the body of Christ belonged to Jesus. So what he says is which, is, which is his body, the body of Christ is Christ's body, the fullness of him, fullness of him, Jesus Christ, who's going to fill all in all. What does that mean? When it says who fills all in all. The idea there is that there is no place where Christ is not. See, he's going to fill all in all. There is no place where Christ is not. And there is nothing that Christ does not fill. How about this omnipresence? You can't hide from him. You can't get away. See, Christ is the source of all holy and happy, happy influences that are in the works of God the Father. When I wrote that, I'm looking at that and saying, wait a minute, just a second. What, what does this mean? Christ is the source. And so the source means we're going to come along and say something else that is the, uh, the, the source is providing something. So Christ is the source. He, he himself is the source of all holy and happy influences. Oh, okay. So there are some sources out here. There, there is a source of happiness. There's a source of holiness. And that holiness and happiness is going to be influential in the life of other people. So Christ is the source of all holy, all happy influences. Do you want to, you want to give a happy influence to somebody? Do you want to get, be a holy influence to somebody? Well, if you're not with Christ, and unbelievers are not, but you started in the right place, you started with Christ when you became a believer in Jesus, you became a part of his body. Now, as you grow, you're going to learn how to live this holy life, how to live this happy life, no matter what the circumstances. And that's going to be an, that will be an influence out there to people in the world. So it says, Christ is the source of all holy and happy influences that are in the works of God the Father. We're being taught what the Word of God is. And guess what? As you mature, guess what you're going to do? As you mature, you're going to think like Christ. You're going to feel like Christ. 
you're going to speak like Christ and you're going to do like Christ. Oh, so if you take on this Christ-like life, Christ then, even through you, is the source of all happy, all holy influences out here that you find in the works of God the Father. Paul concludes this chapter, verse 23, by referring to the church as Christ's body of believers. You see, we are the hands and feet of Jesus Christ to the world. We are the body of Christ, you and I. We are the hands and feet of Jesus to this world. We are meant to influence the people all around us, caring for them, working for divine good. And this means that Christians will have different gifts. You don't have the same gift as I do. There may be some pastors out here. There may be some teachers. There are people with the gift of health. There are people with the gift of giving. Governance. You see, you have a spiritual gift. And this means that Christians will have different gifts, different talents, different skills, different roles to fulfilling and serving God the Father on earth. And we read about those gifts and everything in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. So we're done here, just finished. And it's 8.15 right now. Thank you, Father. Thank you. We'll pick up this coming Wednesday. We're going back to... Uh, we're going to go back to chapter chapter 1 and begin in verse 10 of 1 Corinthians. More fantastic word coming up. Be with us on to, uh, be with us on um, on uh, Sunday and be with us again on Tuesday with Sir Dale. Every Sunday, every Tuesday, every Wednesday and a, ba a mini Bible study coming out every day when we don't have a class if possible. Okay, Father Goodness. Time's up. Classes, classes ended. But the word of God is alive and powerful. It never changes. It's immutable. And the power that goes with it, the power to change lives, the same power that took Christ out of the grave is available to change our lives into all that you want us to be. But guess what, Father? No, you don't need to guess anything. We need to guess. No, we don't even need to guess. We need to know that that same power is found in your word and found in the indwelling Holy Spirit that makes it possible for us to live exactly like you want us to live. For the purpose and the reason you want us to live it. Father, I can't wait to get back this coming Sunday. Can't wait to hear Sir Daryl again on Tuesday. Oh, my goodness. What a blessing. What a joy. Bless Daryl's life. Bless his family. Bless the family of believers that are online with us right now. We are the royal family. There's others out there too that are part of the body of Christ. Bless our lives, Father. Be gracious, gracious to us. Be merciful. And give us a hunger and thirst for your word. Thank you for my spiritual gift, Father. I just pray that I'm serving you well. And I pray this in Christ's name and for his sake. Amen. God bless you all. Good day. I love every one of you. I love you out there. See you next time.